The first reading is from the first and fifth chapters of Amos. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of King Uzziah of Judah and in the days of King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the sheep wither and the top of Carmel dries up. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. So that, and so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Jesus said, I, hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your faded animals, I will not look upon. I take, take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise as you are able for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart, shall flow rivers of living water. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Before we had children, Alan and I took a trip to Alaska, which included a couple of days in Denali National Park. Anyone ever been to Denali? Yeah. Uh, and one of the things we really wanted to do while we were there was go on a backcountry hike. And what I mean by backcountry hiking is hiking off the path. Right? You, just, you go into the wilderness in Denali, you get off the bus, and then you just go. Right? There's no path. You're just in the wilderness in its wild state. There are two ways you can do this. You can plan your own hike and go, uh, or you can sign up to join a ranger-led backcountry hike. And we opted for that one because I had zero experience with backcountry hiking. And I'm a researcher by nature, so um, I like to read up on what I'm getting myself into, or in this case, watch, watch, right, watch videos. So there were these orientation videos on the Denali website uh, that I watched um, multiple times, and I watched all the ones I could find. And I remember the most exciting part of the one video was the part on crossing rivers. Now, there are no bridges in Denali, uh, so sometimes there's a river between where you are and where you need to go. And in Denali, with the glacial melt and the snow melt on warm days, those rivers can rise up uh, during the day. And so sometimes there wasn't a river there, or it was a dry riverbed, and then you come back and there's one. So you needed to know how to cross a river safe safely. Uh, so there's three steps. First step, you read the river. You find the best spot to cross. Things to, to look for, to keep in mind, are depth and speed that the water's moving and where it will take you if should you lose your footing and fall. Next, uh, you prepare. So once you know where you're going to cross, you prepare to cross, you put your waterproof, you put your warm clothing, make sure it's waterproof because, you know, in Alaska, you, warmth is important there. Um, and you unclip your pack just in case you lose your footing and you go down the river, you can escape your pack easily. And then, finally, you're ready to cross. And on, in fast-moving rivers, you do this together. So you stack up with one another. You, you physically hold the person in front of you or their pack, and you stack up in a line. You face upstream, up current, and then you step like sideways like this. And that's how you get across a river. And the people, the person in the front breaks the current, the people in the back are acting an anchor to hold them down. Um, 
So even if a river's not super deep, right, you can get swept away by the fast-moving water. So it's important to do it together. Unfortunately, I never got to use this knowledge, at least yet, right? Because on our hike that day, uh, the water was only a tiny bit wide. You could just step across it. I think you got one foot wet, maybe, if you stepped in it. Um, so I didn't, I didn't get to use this knowledge. But I thought about this orientation video uh, this week as I sat with this Amos text and those words that the Lord speaks through the prophet Amos, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Water is powerful. Like that video made so clear, water is not something to underestimate or to disrespect. So to think of God's justice and righteousness as that pervasive and powerful and strong, it's no wonder that this is the most well-known passage from the book of Amos. The most well-known verse. And if it sounds familiar to you, there might be two reasons. First, we just heard this in worship not too long ago. It was part of the, our summer series. At the end of our summer series, uh, um, when the church is, who is the church? And we looked at our baptismal calling. And there, there in our baptismal liturgy and our affirmation of baptism liturgy is called to work for peace and justice in all the earth. And so when we talked about that, that baptismal calling, we used this text so we just heard this in that context not too long ago. It also may be familiar to you from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. He used this verse from Amos in his I Have a Dream speech on Washington. It's carved into the Civil Rights Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. The context of it there is devotees of civil rights will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. This is a powerful image of God's justice drowning out everything else, sweeping injustice downstream and out of the way, pools of righteousness seeping up all around from the ground. It's powerful and it's a hopeful image for those in desperate need of justice. But for the people like the folks in Israel to whom this prophecy was directed, not so much a comfort as it was a call to wake up to the injustices all around them. Amos prophesied at a time of relative prosperity for Israel. It felt like life was good. They were doing okay, right? They had nice houses and vineyards. They were faithful to God. They're gathering regularly for worship. But as Amos points out to them, it's all been built on the backs of the poor. This is the repeated refrain throughout Amos from chapter 2. They sell the righteousness, they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and push the afflicted out of the way. Again from chapter 4. Hear this word, you who oppress the poor, who crush the needy. In chapter 5, therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from, levies, take from them levies of grain, you have built houses hewn of stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, who push aside the needy in the gate, and so on and so forth. There's no question what kind of justice God is talking about through the prophet Amos here. It's economic justice. It's the vast difference between those who can afford houses and vineyards and those who cannot. It's the treatment of the poor and the needy, the exploitation of others in order to get ahead, in order to get more for oneself. This is going on in the days of Amos. It's a common misconception of that day, and I think that has continued to this day, that God's blessing was shown in material things. So if, if the people were prospering, then God couldn't. God must be pleased. So here are the people with their fancy houses and their beautiful vineyards coming together to worship God, to give thanks and praise for this bounty that they have. And God reminds them through these disruptive words of Amos 
that is not what I am about. That is not at all what it means to be my people. Let's rewind back in our biblical story, back to the wilderness, to the story we heard a few weeks ago when God's people were finally free from slavery in Egypt, and they were beginning their 40-year wilderness lesson on what it means to live as God's people. And God rains down manna from heaven to sustain them each day, and each day they are to go and to gather enough for the day. Except for the day before the Sabbath, and they gather enough for two days. But they were learning God's economy. God's economy is different than the economy of the empire, the economy of Pharaoh. Pharaoh's economy from which they came was all about storing up and keeping for oneself and building bigger and doing it all at the cost of other people's lives, exploiting other people to get what they want. God's economy, by contrast, is an economy where everyone has enough. Even the poorest of the poor at least have enough, has enough to get by and where no one is exploited. Being God's people is the call to live in God's economy and to do something to stop the unjust practices of exploitation of the, that the economy of the empire does so much. Your gratitude for what you have is not enough. It's empty hymns of praise if your worship is not accompanied by some act towards justice for the poor and the needy. This is a convicting text. I'm guessing there's not a person in this room and probably not worshiping with us online that doesn't feel uncomfortable, myself included. And we don't like to feel uncomfortable. I don't like to be uncomfortable. I can, I'll claim it for myself. Right? So it's tempting to, like, to try to point this and lob this text at others. And, and I can give you a long list of corrupt corporations that are putting profits over people. Like it's someone else's problem and not my own. Instead of hearing this text for myself and using it to reflect, are my own economic practices just? Do the businesses I support pay their workers fa fairly? Are the people who make my clothes and get, food to my, get the food to my table able to live an abundant life too? How can a nation as wealthy as ours still have so many living with food insecurity or without access to affordable housing? And how does my inaction and indifference and ignorance to all of that contribute to the problem? uncomfortable text. I need God's justice to roll down like water, to knock my stubborn, unmoving feet out from under me every once in a while. I think I need to go back to my backcountry training. Remember step one. Step one of crossing a river in the backcountry, find the safest spot to cross. And in that process, step one involves admitting and accounting for the possibility of failure. What will happen if I lose my footing? Where will I get washed down to? Is it a shallow gravel bar where I can make my way to shore easily enough? Or is there some hazard and danger waiting? Admitting the possibility of failure is a scary step but it's essential for our survival. And so it is with the life of faith. In fact, not just entertaining the possibility, but actively admitting we have failed. Indeed, admitting we have failed is step one. It's step one in our practice of confession and forgiveness. It's step one in coming to the table to receive communion. And it's essential to our survival, and it's essential in our fight for justice. It's a humbling step to take. To admit, I don't get it right most of the time. I need God's justice to take over like a rushing stream. It takes humility 
but we need not be afraid of it. Because we know where we end up if we get swept away. We end up in the ever-flowing stream of righteousness. Righteousness means right relationship. The waters of God's justice bring you into right relationship with God and with one another and with God's creation. You end up in the pool of God's mercy and love. God's justice is one river you don't need to fight your way across. It's okay to get swept up because God's mercy, God's grace awaits. The water is more than fine. The water is the water of life. Amen.